to our sixth Bible study on the subject. Uh, what does the Bible really teach about homosexuality by Kevin DeYoung? As I mentioned in our previous study, it's always good to hear where the, the author of our book that we are sharing on, uh, what is his background, his or her background. Uh, Kevin DeYoung, which is the author of what does the Bible really teach about homosexuality is a American reformed theologian and author. He currently serves as the senior pastor of Christ Covenant Church in Matthews, North Carolina. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Hope College, a Master of Divinity from Gordon Cornell Theological Seminary, and he has a PhD from the University of the Sister. Our Bible studies are every Thursday uh, at 7 p.m. If you have not been a part of our previous studies, please go to our YouTube channel, Rev Anthony E. Owens Ministries, LLC. And our videos are there on our channel and any other any of our other con uh, content. And I pray that you'll go back and review those previous studies if you were not a part of our original uh, sessions when we started out. I pray that you will share this uh, study with your friends and family and others. Uh, go to, you can go to our uh, website and register uh, RSVP. So I know how many will be in the sessions and please purchase the book and, and follow along as we as we study uh, God's word together. And so let us go to the Lord in prayer as we normally do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity once again to share your word and to just be open to that which you will share with us on this day. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will enlighten our minds as well as our hearts on a subject that is that's circulating in the in the media, in our in our country. And so, Lord, we want to understand the subject even better than we did before. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, chapter six is entitled. The, bar, the Bible hardly ever mentions homosexuality. The Bible hardly ever mentions homosexuality. Wow, that's that's just that's mind boggling just to just to say that. It says the Bible hardly ever mentions homosexuality. The first step in delegitimizing what the Bible says about homosexuality, suggesting the Bible hardly says anything about the subject. It, it hardly mentions anything about the subject. Out of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible and more than 3,000 verses, find only a dozen or so pages that deal explicitly with homosexuality. That is mind boggling. Six or seven passages have for centuries prevented those engaged in homosexual activity from finding acceptance in our churches. Being torn apart because of a small handful of disputed texts concerning a minor issue about which Jesus never ever said anything. The Bible says so little about homosexuality. Why do Christians, why do Christians, and why do Christians insist on talking about it so much? A fair question with plenty of answers according to the author. Revisionist leaders wanted to have the conversation. Listen to this now. This is important. Revisionist, revisionist leaders wanted to have the conversation. 
there is so much discussion about issues like abortion, euthanasia, and same-sex marriage is because many have sought to legalize and legitimize the actions that were until 50 years ago considered immoral and illegal. The Bible says little about homosexuality is because it was comparatively uncon uncontroversial sin among ancient Jews and Christians. Let me repeat that again. The Bible says little about homosexuality is because it was comparatively uncontroversial sin among ancient Jews and Christians. There is no evidence that ancient Judaism or early Christianity tolerated any expressions of homosexual activity. Let me say that again. There is no evidence that ancient Judaism or early Christianity tolerated any expressions of homosexual activity. The Bible says a lot about adultery, religious hypocrisy, economic injustice, and pagan worship because these were common sins for God's people in both testaments, both the Old and the New Testament. The prophets did not rail against homosexual practice because as a particular obvious and egregious sin, it was less frequently committed in the covenant community. Wow, this is enlightening. The Bible is not silent on the issue of homosexual behavior. Explicitly condemned in the Mosaic law in Leviticus, you know, Leviticus, used as a vivid example of human rebellion in Paul's most important letter in Romans, the first chapter, listed among a host of other serious vices in two different epistles in first corinthians you see it here where it says oh do you not know that under unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither the sexually immoral nor adulterers nor 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 idolaters nor adult adulterers nor men who practice homosexuality nor thieves no group the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the robbers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then in 1 Timothy 1 and 11, 1 Timothy 1 verses 8 through 11, where it says, now we know that the law is good, 8 yeah okay yeah yeah now we know let me see 311 let me see here. now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully understanding that the law is laid not understanding this that the law is not laid down for the just but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and sinner and sinners for the ungodly who profane the for those who strike their fathers and their mothers murderers the sexual immoral men who practice homosexuality enslavers liars purges and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed god who which i have been entrusted and so what we have here is listed among a host of other serious vices in two different epistles. We just read from 1 Corinthians, now we're in 1 Timothy. The reasons God destroyed the most infamous cities in the Bible, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible speaks in a single verse as an aside with no agreed 
upon historical interpretation about people being baptized on behalf of the dead, which we find in First uh, Corinthians 15, chapter 9, we are at we are right to think this is not a matter that should detain us long and one we should not be too dogmatic about dogmatic about. There is nothing ambiguous about the biblical witness concerning homosexual behavior. Many revisionist scholars acknowledge the Bible is uniformly negative towards same-sex activity. Okay, it says that Dutch scholar Pim Bronk, Bronk, B-R-O-N-K, Pim Bronk, that many Christians are eager to see homosexuality supported by the Bible, stating plainly, in this, he quotes, in this case, that support is lacking. End of quote. He doesn't think more positions must be dependent on the Bible, which is why he can support homosexual behavior. As a scholar, he recognizes that wherever homosexual intercourse is mentioned in the scripture, it is condemned, rejected, rejection is foregone conclusion. The assessment of it nowhere constitutes a problem. No positive argument for homosexuality can be made from the Bible. Made from the Bible. Only argument that texts don't mean what they seem to, to mean, and that specific text can be overwritten by other consideration. Sexual immorality is precisely the sort of sin that characterizes those who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There are at least eight vice lists in the New Testament. You find it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 13, Romans chapter 13, verse 13, 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses 9 and 10, Galatians 5. Let's go to Galatians 5 and 19. Let's go to Galatians and see. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are envy, evident. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The apostle declared that the sins of the flesh are obvious, meaning either, as some suggest, that they are public and cannot be hidden, or better sense, some are private sins, that they originate with the sinful nature and not with a new nature and in, dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The list, the list of sins are commonly seen to fall into four categories. First, three sexual sins are mentioned. Sexual immorality is often translated fornication. From this word comes the term pornography. Pornia, pornia, pornia re refers to any in all forms of illicit sexual relationship. Okay, you got impurity, which is a broad term referring to more uncleanness in thought, word, and deed. Debauchery uh, connotes an open, shameless, brazen display of, of, of these evils. And so, you see, where Jesus never said anything about homosexuality is not accurate. Jesus reaffirmed the creation account of marriage as the one flesh, one, one. Jesus, say, see, the author said, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. It's not accurate. Jesus reaffirmed the creation account of marriage as the one flesh union of man and a woman in Matthew's gospel, chapter 19, verses 4 and 6, Mark's Jock gospel, chapter 10, verses 6 and 9. And he condemned the sin of ponia, which is a broad word encompassing every kind of sexual sin. Leading New Testament lexicon 
defines pornea, pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A, as unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitution, unchastity, fornication. The New Testament scholar James Edwards states that por pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A, pornea, can be found in Greek literature with reference to a variety of illicit sexual practices, including adultery, fornication, prostitution, and homosexuality. homosexuality. Jesus did not give a special sermon on homosexuality because all of his listeners understood that same-sex behavior was prohibited in the Pentateuch and reckoned as one of the many expressions of sexual sin, pornea, off limits for Jews. So let me repeat that again. Jesus did not give a special sermon on homosexuality because all of his listeners understood that same-sex behavior was prohibited in the Pentateuch and reckoned as one of the many expressions of sexual sin, por pornea, off limits for the Jews. Jesus affirmed the abiding authority of the Old Testament in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 17. Let's go there. Matthew's Gospel. Let's see what Jesus said. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Do you not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others do, to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them all will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never inherit the kingdom of God. And so we see Jesus affirmed the abiding authority of the Old Testament in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. And he understood his disciples will, would fill out uh, the true meaning of his person and works found in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 12. And Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 48 and 49. A third way, telling conservative Christians that homosexuality is not a make or break issue, and we are wrong to make it so. Faithfulness to the word of God compels us to view sexual immorality with the same seriousness. Living an ungodly life is contrary to the sound teaching that defines the Christian that defines the Christian found in first Corinth meaning first Timothy 1 8 and 11 we already read that verse and then Titus 1 and 16 we go to Titus 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 1 verse 16 They profess to, to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any, any good work. Okay. Okay. Okay, here. So it says here, living in, un <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Living an ungodly life is contrary to the second teaching that defines the Christian in Titus 1 and 16. Okay. Okay. Drunkenness must not be confused with light. Grace must not be confused with grace must not be confused with license. Unchecked sin must not be confused 
with the good news of justification apart from the works of the law. The New Testament sees it as a matter of excommunication found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and separation found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 12 through 20 and a temptation for perverse compromise found in Jude, uh, Jude chapter 3, I mean Jude. Homosexuality is not the only sin in the world, nor is it the most critical one to address in many church contexts. If 1 Corinthians is right, it is not an overstatement to say that solemnizing same-sex sexual behavior like supporting any form of sexual immorality runs the risk of leading people to hell. Scripture often warns us and in the severest terms against finding our sexual identity apart from Christ and against pursuing sexual practice inconsistent with being in Christ, whether that is homosexual sin or much more frequently heterosexual sin. Let me repeat that again. Scripture often warns us in the severest terms against finding our sexual identity apart from Christ and against pursuing sexual practice inconsistent with being in Christ, whether that is homosexual sin or much more frequently heterosexual sin. Biblical teaching consists consistent and unambiguous homosexual acti activity is not God's will for his people. The Bible says more than enough about hom homosexual practice for us to say something to. So that concludes our study on this sixth chapter of what does the Bible really teach about homosexuality. Uh, Kevin DeYoung, I pray that you were enlightened. Uh, please share this video with your family and friends. Please uh, like, please share, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you for chatting live with us as this streaming. May God bless you and keep you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come before your people once again and to share in this study. I pray, O oh Lord, that this study has been a blessing to everyone who has viewed it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.